Today's episode is being brought to you by Goya Foods. If it's Goya, it has to be good. As you know yourself in the game of sports, there's a lot of negativity. Yes. And you gotta be able to you gotta be able to turn that off. Because in baseball, in a lot of sports, they tell you you're too small, you're too mm-hmm. short, you too you can't run, you don't have a good enough arm, you don't hit home runs. And if you believe all that stuff, then you're never gonna make it. Sacks in the morning. Sports, money, life. Steve Sacks. Hi, Steve Sacks here with Sacks in the morning. And today is Thursday, and we've got a really special couple of guests on with us this morning. We're going to be talking to the great Bucky Dent and his beautiful wife, Angie. Hey, you guys, welcome to Sacks in the morning. Thank you so much for being here. Oh, we're glad to be here. Glad to yeah. join you, man. It's been a long time since we've talked, and we're, we're glad to be on with you. Oh, thank you. Thank you so much. And Bucky, as you mentioned, been a long time. I mean, Bucky was my manager. What year were you there in managing with us, Bucky, with the Yankees? That was in, is that in 80, 89 and 90? 89 and, part of 89 and 90. That's right. And boy, we had some long games, didn't we? I mean, we could score some runs, but we just didn't, they didn't provide us with much pitching. No, we couldn't pitch, but we did. We had a pretty good offensive club, yeah. and we lost a lot of close games, too. Yes. And I remember taking over for Dallas and uh, joining the team, and the team played hard. We just yeah. were a little short with some arms, like you said. Yeah, and Bucky, I got to tell you, I, I don't know if I ever told you when I went over there, I was probably trying to be so professional, but you were one of the guys that I absolutely idolized when I was in when high school. And for any of you that don't remember how good Bucky was, he was a three-time All-Star. He played 11 years in the big leagues. He was the 1978 World Series MVP, hit one of the most iconic home runs in in playoff history, the home run in in the championship series against the Boston Red Sox and Mike Torres. Bucky, was that in 1978 as well? Yeah, 78. Okay, you you got to tell me, you got to tell me what it was like. First of all, I don't think a lot of people thought you were going to hit the home run. Like me, you weren't a big home run hitter. But how about the T-shirts all over New England after you hit the home run? What did it say? Bucky effing Dent? I'm not going to swear on the podcast, but did it say something like that, Bucky? Absolutely. <laughs> and, uh, I think that I love it. was a guy. He, he was a guy that gave it to me. I guess the story was after the game, he was driving home with his wife's soot. And uh, he got out of the mountains and just walked over to the mountain and just screamed. Bucky yeah. effing Dent. So I kind of kicked off from there and... Uh, <laughs> That's you know, amazing. He was a great guy. I loved him. When I got traded in 82, he wound up renting my house in 83. And, oh, wow. Uh, oh, yeah. It was a funny story because I had redid my house and put white carpet in and everything. And he called me and said he wanted to rent my house. And I <laughs> said, I ain't having you spit tobacco all over my house. Uh, uh, right. You know? So I wound up, before I went to spring training that year, I said, okay, you can rent my house. I put pictures up behind every door that said sock dented, you know? <laughs> That's so great. We had, we had our own good kick. I'll get a lot of that, but he was a great guy. I loved him, man. That's great. Hey, hey, Angie, I got to ask you what it's like. I mean, you must have known of Bucky and, you know, how great of a player he was. He was a, such a big heartthrob when he was playing. Bucky, were you on Dallas? Is that the show that you were on or one of those shows? that, that no, you... I, I made the movie, The Dallas Cowboy Cheerleaders. That's the one it was. Okay, I, I remember that. And Bucky was like the heartthrob. Bucky was like the guy that everybody just idolized. Oh, he was so handsome. He still is now. But but uh, I remember when I finally got to meet him, I was like starstruck because this is a guy when I was in high school, I graduated in 78 and Bucky was already doing it in the big leagues. I'm I'm curious to on your side of it, Angie, when you met Bucky, how did that happen? And I know you guys were business partners for a long time. So go ahead. Oh, I met Bucky. I didn't know who Bucky was. I was not a Yankee fan. I was from Louisville, Kentucky. So uh-huh. we followed college basketball. And I met him at the Yankee fantasy camp and started working for his charity because my background is I'm a CPA. And as I worked with him and did events, I learned who he was. And I, I guess at some of the signings that we did, women would come with that infamous poster Mm. and some of them would can be so excited. And I, it was just really, I was awestruck by how much he was loved and Mm. admired and I guess he was quite a sex symbol back then. Oh, yeah. He, so, uh, yeah. You know, what we figured is that I was at University of Texas when he was with the Rangers. And he said, you know, you could have had me then. Uh, and I'm like, I'm uh, so uh, not interested. 
<laughs> at that time, that's right. you know, I was, uh, I, I was a little bit younger than him. Yeah. And I guess that's what made it all work. I think when he met me and I really was didn't know who he was and I wasn't like a regular fan person, mm -hmm. I think that was an attraction for him. Yeah. And I think it's really probably the word that would describe it most is just the gratitude that we have for how people feel about him mm -hmm. still this many years later. Yes. And when I go to signings, I think it's wonderful to watch everybody, whether it's the women that had the poster or young boys that were growing up that had heard the stories from their dad, you know, whoever it is, I, I kind of take the back seat. I went from saying I was the purse holder and the photographer to, you know, I'm his <laughs> wife now. Yes. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah, um, yeah, I I love it. I think it's really an honor, and yeah. I think he enjoys the fans' respect mm -hmm. and love of him. Yeah, I think so. that's that's a great way to put it, Angie. I mean, B Bucky's done some great things in his life, and one of them we're going to talk about in a second. But I think the overriding thing, the overarching value, I think is Bucky is one of those guys in baseball that is really a great guy, and. If I mean, I don't know anybody that could dislike a Bucky Dent. I mean, everybody loves him, and I think that's what just supersedes anything that he's done in baseball. But I wanted to ask you another question, Bucky. We'll get to you in a minute. We want to talk to the important one here. Um, <laughs> Angie, this is amazing that Bucky is going to be inducted into New York State Baseball Hall of Fame in just two weeks. Tell us your perspective from that side, and then, Bucky, I want to hear it from you as well. It's a tremendous honor. I mean, it's a tremendous honor for him. It's a wonderful thing for me to be able to see him go through and be honored because I've been to, since I've known Bucky, we, he's been honored by several different organizations in counties and little leagues. But to be inducted into the New York State Hall of Fame where his dream was to be a Yankee and to see that this come to fruition, it's kind of, it goes from like childhood through, he's still blessed today to be able to do a lot of events for the Yankees sure. and in the baseball world. So mm -hmm. I think this is kind of like, as he always says, sports is a game of moments. Mm -hmm. And this is one of those moments where I think he's going to get to stand up and really look back at his career and what it's enabled him to do as far as giving back through charity. And he had his baseball school for all those years. Mm -hmm. And so for me, I just get to sit back and go, that's my husband. <laughs> That's right. And I'm so proud of him. I mean, you know what? I love this journey with him. It's everything's new for me, but we just to see, like you said, he's such an amazing individual besides what he did in baseball. Yes. And I just think he deserves this. Absolutely. And I'm so excited for him. Absolutely. You know, I'm truly honored when they called and told me that they were going to induct me into the New York State Hall of Fame. I mean, I was kind of taken back. You know, my dream, like she said, was to play for the Yankees when I was 10 years old. I fell in love with the Yankees because back then we used to watch the games on black and white TV and the mm -hmm. teacher would come because they were playing during the day. back. Sure. Then. I, I remember it well. I loved it, you know, because sure. she would say, okay, if you're big, we'll turn the games on. I fell in love with Mickey Mantle. Oh, yeah. And Yogi Berra mm -hmm. and Whitey Ford and Roger Maris. All those guys were my heroes. Wow. And, uh, you know, and then to be able to be inducted into the New York State Hall of Fame where I played and just the Yankee fans were, or you played there, you yeah. know, they're, oh, yeah. they're great. You know, I mean, tremendous. they can be tough on you, but yep. they make you play. Yep. It's just a tremendous honor. And I'm, I'm looking forward to it. It's wonderful, Bucky. You certainly deserve it. And, you know, I think one thing we can all say about the Yankees and their, you know, their fan base, since we both played there is I felt that if you were transparent and went out there and played your tail off no matter how much money you make. If you gave it your all and you really busted your tail, the Yankee fans are going to respect you. Whatever comes out, they appreciate the effort, I think, uh, more than anything else. Absolutely. You know? you know, and the thing that helped me was I came from a big city. I came from Chicago. Mm. And Chicago was basically the same as yeah. far as if you didn't play well, they let you know about it. You know, and New York fans are like that. If you come there and just play hard and give it your all. They're working class people, yes. you know, and yes. they, they love you. And, mm -hmm. uh, That's exactly um, right. And be able to be a part of that. You were part of two great organizations yourself, the Dodgers and the Yankees, and both of them have that tradition. We just played for a tough owner. Yeah. I mean, Steinbetter was no-nonsense guy as far as winning and losing. He expected that from mm -hmm. you. So, and the fans do too. Yeah. We really respect you if you go out there and you just bust your hump and, yeah. and give it 100%. You know what, Bucky and Angie, I can tell you, I never had a problem with George ever. I never had one problem with him. I mean, 
when I first got there, I know he expected a lot, but you know, I kind of grew up that way. My dad was like that. And I think that we expect a lot out of the people that we care about. We want them to do well. Let's take a brief break for our sponsor. Thanks to Goya for their support of today's episode. It's no wonder Goya's commitment to excellence is the cornerstone of the company credo. If it's Goya, it has to be good. This simple yet deeply resonant pledge is the evolution of Goya Foods as a leader in the Latin American food industry and a trusted American brand. Al Hendrickson Toyota, it's always worth the drive. When you make the drive to Al Hendrickson Toyota, you're getting an experience that will make you want to return again and again. Visit in person in South Florida or visit online to see the inventory of new, pre-owned, and certified pre-owned vehicles, proving Al's got it all at every step of the car buying process. Wherever you may be shopping from, Al's got value, Al's got selection, Al's got deals, Al's got service, Al's got the right team. It's always worth the drive to Al Hendrickson Toyota. Al Hendrickson Toyota is the number one volume Toyota dealer in the Southeast region. Online at alhendricksontoyota.com. Toyota, let's go places. And now, back to our conversation. But Bucky, being a guy that played shortstop and you were so fundamentally sound, I got to ask you, do you cringe sometimes when t- we, we see this today? Uh, I see guys catching the ball off to the side with one hand. I see them coming in on balls and they just kind of run through it instead of getting behind the ball and shuffling and getting around the ball and throwing it that way. I just see some of these, some of the times of the fundamentals. And I don't want to be one of those guys that say, well, oh, we did everything perfect because we didn't. There's no way we did. But I just see this some of the fundamentals of the game where a hitter hits the ball and he runs, hits first base and if there's a guy in second base, he just keeps running because they don't hit the cutoff man. And I don't know what, what it is today, but it's a change. It is a change. And like you said, you know, you watch them play and they're, they play out of control. You know, yeah. I mean, we always talk about Al Munchak when I came up with the White Sox. He taught me how to play shortstop. Mm. He, he taught me how to use my hands, use my feet, turn double plays, get rid right. of the ball, catch the ball in the proper position all the time and just make the plays. I hate to say routine because I don't think there's anything routine about a baseball being in at you. Yeah. But you know, to make the plays you're supposed to make and then their great plays will come. But we were taught to catch the ball fundamentally sound. Mm-hmm. And yeah, it does bother, you know, because they make a lot of mistakes, you know. And yeah. They're out of position on cutoff throws. Yep. They catch the ball the wrong way. They mm-hmm. turn the wrong way. Yep. And it's just a little disheartening to see a little bit of that. Yeah. How about everybody coming out of the bullpen? Everybody throws 100 miles an hour, it seems, today. Well, they gauge the ball coming out of the hand instead of coming across the plate like they did when we played. I think they did a lifetime version of Nolan Ryan throwing, and they gauged it by how they do it today. He was, a, I believe, 108. That's what Nolan Ryan would have been throwing today. So is everybody really throwing 100 by the standards that we saw? I don't know. I got to think that some of it's true, but they just keep pitching on high fastballs, and those guys keep hunting the bottom of the ball, and they either pop it up or strike out. Some people strike out 200 times in a season. Well, it's just kind of crazy. The game as far as hitting, you know, you – you were a line drive hitter. We were contact hitters. We put the ball yeah. in play. We hit the ball the other way. Now it drives me nuts, this launch angle type <laughs> stuff. And, yeah. you know, strike out. I mean, it's okay to strike out 250 times. And everybody's on one side of the field and the whole side of the other field's open. And they say, well, these guys throw too hard to hit the ball the other way. Well, mm. I don't know about that. I know they yeah. do throw hard. And I know guys coming out of the bullpen, they throw as hard as they can for ever how many outs, three outs, six outs that they get. But, yeah, I mean, it's a little bit different. It's yeah. a little bit different to watch. And now they made some changes that I don't understand, you know, like making the bags bigger. I mean, yeah. For 100 some years, the bag was 8 inches. Now we're going to make it 18 inches. So, yeah. I mean, what the heck are we doing, you know? Yes. I mean, we can't take out guys at second base. We can't run over to catcher anymore. Right. I mean, when you played second base, I mean, oh. guys, you knew who was going to come down there and try and kill you. They were going to try it all. The, you knew that as a shortstop. You right? learn how to get out of the way. Yeah. You know, you learn the fundamentals of getting the heck out yeah. of the way and not getting taken out on a double play. Sure. But, you know, I mean, it's just like. They can't even it, touch it, you. And they can't throw hey, inside. What it would be yeah. like to hit today, Bucky? They don't throw inside. Do you lean out there and hit that ball with some authority the other way now, right? I mean, oh, it's kind of crazy. Yeah, yeah. Yep, it is. It's kind of it's kind of crazy. But uh, still a wonderful game. Yes. You know, it's still a game that 
we do watch. It drives us nuts a little bit, but yeah. it's still a great game. You know, yeah. we got an opportunity. Both of us got a chance to play yeah. in some great cities, play on some great teams, and uh, yeah. you know, do our thing. And it's just a beautiful game. Yeah, and we were we were, obviously we were both very blessed to be able to do what we wanted to do. I felt really good about the chance to play baseball, and my brother got to play baseball in the big leagues with me. As a, as a matter of fact, for a while, and my brother being a catcher, Bucky, and the fact that they can't run to the catcher. I saw him get clocked a couple of times in the minor leagues when we were playing together. But you know what he said? He said he likes the, that engagement. He likes the fact that they can run you over. I mean, not only he wants to get run over, but that's kind of the, the mysterious part of the game. And what's going to happen? Are they going to try to intimidate you? Are they going to try to buzz you a little bit? Are they going to run me over? Those kind of the parts of the game are gone. I, I kind of feel bad that we miss a lot of the personality of the game. Like maybe Lou Pinella coming out and <laughs> throwing the base in right field when he was with the Reds or... Or Earl Weaver throwing dirt all over the umpire. We don't see those personality parts of the game anymore. I wish we did, you know? Yeah, I mean, you, you look for a close play or something and see, you know, Earl Weaver going out there and <laughs> kicking dirt on the up. Billy Martin going yes. out there. Lou Pinella, you know, I played with Lou, and he was one of the, oh, man, he was, he was funny to watch sometimes, yeah. you know, because he would scream at the pitchers. He'd, he'd scream at the fans. <laughs> he'd, he'd yell at them. Then he'd yell at the pitcher, you know, throw me fastball so yeah would throw a fastball and he'd get a base hit and he'd go i'm sure you see what i, I baited about? him into oh, it right yeah. I mean, yeah. yeah but i mean you know just the toughness of the game facing all over oh, Ryan or yeah you know i remember when i was a rookie and we went over to play the cardinals and they Gib, gibson was pitching oh and they said er, whatever you do don't dig in man don't yeah. dig in and go yeah. look at it well my first at bat he threw me a little spin and slider i hit over the bag and I got to second base. I didn't look up. I no. just like kept my head down. Yes. I like, this guy next time you can hit me in the head. That's what know? I did against Nolan Ryan. I ever got hit. I was like, I almost felt bad about it. I got, I got up to the plate. I almost wanted to genuflect. You know, I mean, it's like this yeah. guy's like, he's like, you go around Sandy Koufax at Dodger Stadium now. It's like, oh my god, it's like royalty. I mean, he's yes. such a good man too, and you just want to be happy just to be in their presence. So I yeah. think what's good is we're both still fans of the game, and that's the most important part. Angie, what have you seen? I mean, we talk, Bucky and I can talk for hours about this part of it, but from your perspective, when you met him and you kind of got and learned a lot more about baseball, what do you take away? What do you see today in baseball? Is it, is it still that happy thing, a bunch of older guys playing a little boy's game or what's your perspective from a baseball's life? Well, I think I've learned a lot about baseball, obviously being with Bucky, but I think that the old school baseball guys that his group of guys that I've gotten to really know and listen uh -huh. to everybody's opinion on the game today versus, you know, I think there's a place for statistics. Mm -hmm. I think, you know, I have, I have two boys, one that works for MLB Network and the other one that's studying to be a mental coach. And I think we've learned, we've come kind of full circle. The stats are important, but, you know, yep. you still need some old school baseball. Bucky always says they're always swinging for the sky, yeah. you know, launch angle, everything. Mm -hmm. You know, they, they like to just keep the ball in play. Mm -hmm. and, you know, so I'm kind of learning a little bit here and there. And I never really paid attention probably before I was with Bucky. So I would say that when I compare the game then, the films that I've seen and what mm -hmm. the guys have told me in the game now, I mean, you know, it's still so much fun to walk mm -hmm. into the stadium and be a part of that atmosphere. You know, yes, but we'd like to see a little bit more play on the ground and not so much about the guys and all the money they're making. But this is the world yeah. today. This is the game today. Yeah. So Bucky used to tell me the stories about, you know, he drove a crane on the off season, delivered prescriptions on the island over here. He worked hard, mm -hmm. you know, real hard. And he always will say, well, my salary in today's world would have been blah, blah, blah. And oh. I'm kind of just in awe yes. of the salary structures. And, mm -hmm. you know, but at the same time, we still watch the games. There's a lot of talent on the field and we still love it. It's just, mm -hmm. we kind of have to like change with the times yeah, and what it's becoming and appreciate it and respect it. And Bucky will still go, wow, well, you know, right, <laughs> you right. put this way. Yeah. but you know, watching a game with him, he's already like four innings ahead. <laughs> And yeah. telling me what's going to happen. Yeah. And I'm well, kind of like, wait a second. I'm just trying to figure out what that means. Was that an yeah. error? Yeah. That's not fun. I'd well, probably drive him crazy. Well, the good thing about it is she's gotten to like at old timers and we do still do a lot of things for Yankees. She's gotten a chance to be around Goose and oh. Gidry 
Yeah. Oh, yeah. And, and Mickey Rivers. Oh, and yeah. Those guys, and hear them talk about the game. And back then, you know, and I always tell her, Goose and I always start laughing because we started together in 1970. Yeah. I was they, teammates with Goose, too. Love him. Right. Uh, yeah. Go, go oh, ahead, Bucky. Him, yeah. I'm sorry to interrupt you. Go ahead. Uh, but, you know, we, we started together back in Appleton. We made 500 bucks a month with Terry Forrester. Terry Forrester was our other roommate. Oh, wow. And, you know, we slept on like one mattress, all three of us. We had two sheets and one blanket. And we drove wow. like a 63 Chevy, you know, and made $10 wow. a day. But we all made it, you know. Yeah. And it's that part of it that I mm. think makes you really appreciate the hard work that you put in. We didn't make a lot of money and your gold and nothing was going to stop you was to try and play in the big leagues. And when you made it, it was like, yeah, this is like the greatest thing. Yes. Uh, you know, because my first game that I ever saw in Milwaukee in 1973 was the first time I ever been in a major league stadium. Roland Heeman picked me up in Chicago, drove me. I got there in the third inning and I walked out. I, I walked down that long tunnel. And I walked uh. in the dugout. It was the third inning and it was like, this is a palace, all this wow. green with lights and people, yes. 35,000 people. Then they put me in, and Chuck Tanner put me in a 10th inning to play second base, and first pop-up was here. I think George Scott hit a top and pop-up, and I'm going, just don't drop this thing, please. <laughs> <Get up." laughs> so, yes. You know, I mean, yep. you know, but yeah, those are the things that you look yeah. back on. But she's had a chance to be around some of those guys, old-timers, and yeah. it's fun. She gets a kick out of some of the stories. You first know, of all. Crazy. Yeah, I got to say, Angie, you, you say that oh, I'm trying to pick it up and like, you sound like an agent. I mean, you know what's going on. She knows what's going on big time when, you know, I think one of the things that you mentioned was absolutely important in today's game where you can push back a little bit on because they all they talk about is exit. What's the exit velocity, exit velocity? Well, when Jose Altuve was trying to come out of that slump that he's been in, he was in a one for 23 slump. The hit that he got was the soft liner that was a dastardly pitch way on the outside part of the plate that he just kind of flicked out there like a like it was a tennis game. And he got a base hit, which started him on the right track again. But does exit velocity matter on that? Does it matter when you got two strikes and you, and you can hit a soft line drive the other way to bring it a run? Who cares about exit velocity? I don't care about that. I care about contact. Right? right? That's what matters. Yeah, I always say placement's the name of the game. Yes. There's, <laughs> there's you got to place it. There's know, no but, question uh, about it. I could sit here with you guys all day. You guys are awesome. And what we usually do, Bucky and Angie's, we finish it off because my podcast is about being positive and the power of thought and all those great things. And so we like to ask at the end what your keys to success are. Obviously, you both are very successful people. So I'd like to, if you could, if you'd lend us some of your knowledge about what you think the keys to success are in life or business or just in general, what is it with you two? And we'd, I'd like to both of you to say it. Well, I think for us, we really believe that um, it, the power of positive thinking and whatever you think and, you know, whatever you put your energies towards grows. And so we really try to live every day just with so much gratitude and positivity and love and try to touch as many lives as we can along the way. And really just cherish and be grateful for everything we do have, not worry about what isn't working out and what's not great in our lives. And I tell you what, we've been really fortunate. I mean, wow. we share a beautiful life and a great love, and we have a wonderful family and friends, and it's working for us. Wow, <laughs> so that's I, I great. Think, you know, the big thing is, you know, when I was growing up, God really smiled on me. I had a brother that was tough, like your dad, you know, mm -hmm. he taught me to play the game the right way. He taught me to be positive, to work. Work ethic was a big thing, practice, to be on time, to give it everything. And the other thing that I always think it's important is, as you know yourself in the game of sports, there's a lot of negativity. Yes. And you got to be able to, you got to be able to turn that off because in baseball and a lot of sports, they tell you you're too small, you're too mm -hmm. short, you're too, you can't run, you don't have a good enough arm, you don't hit home runs. And if you believe all that stuff, then you're never going to make it, mm -hmm. you know? So I, I believe the power of, positive thinking, the power that you've got to turn those negative thoughts off and you've got to really have a great work ethic. Yeah. Wow. What wonderful words from both you know, of yourself you. As an infielder, yeah. you know, you take, yep. if you're really going to be good, you have to work at it. You have to take a thousand ground balls. You have to really work at baseball. Baseball is a tough game. It's yes. a tough game mentally because you're going to have, I always tell her, uh, our son, you know, streaks follow streaks in baseball. You can be hot as a firecracker and you can get cold as a tomato, you know. Yes. So 
Um, you have that positive and you got to grind and you, and you got to have a mental toughness up on you. Yeah. Wow. What great words from both of you. I, I wish the whole world could hear this, but thank you guys so much for being on. This has just been such a pleasure, a treat, and we're going to bless a lot of people when they hear your words. I'll tell you that. So I can't thank you enough for being on. Thank you both so much. We're glad to be on and good to talk to you and good to see you again, my man. You too, Bucky. I hope to see yeah. you in person too. I'm looking yeah. forward to it. Oh. Yeah. Look forward to meeting you, Angie. I got to get him to invite you back to old timers days. <laughs> All right. I'll come. Yeah. <laughs> I'll come. Yeah. Yeah. You take care of yourself. I hope to see you soon. You too. Thanks. Thank you both so much. Thanks okay. much. Thank you. God bless Bye. you, man. Bless you both. Thank you. If you like what you heard today, please give us a positive review, subscribe, and share the program. Also, be sure to listen to my Sacks in the Morning shorts three days a week for a couple of minutes of uplifting suggestions to get your day off to a great start. Our music is performed by my adorable niece, Elena Jane. And remember, to reach your goals and your dreams, follow your emotional heart. Good Greek Moving and Storage, your superhero movers. Good Greek Moving and Storage exists to provide you an extraordinary moving experience, period. They make the ethos of their every step from the moment of your first phone call all the way to the placement of your last end table in your new home. A stress-free, positive experience. Offering concierge services to answer all your questions, you can trust Good Greek Moving and Storage and Spiro the Hero with all your relocation needs. Good Greek Moving and Storage is the official movers of the Florida Gators, Florida Panthers, Tampa Bay Bucks, Miami Heat, Miami Marlins, Florida International University, and the University of Miami. And thanks to Al Hendrickson Toyota for their support of this podcast. And be sure to visit alhendricksontoyota.com. Toyota, let's go places. Thanks to Goya for their support of today's episode. It's no wonder Goya's commitment to excellence is the cornerstone of the company credo. If it's Goya, it has to be good.